The whole idea of advancing mechanics in the video game world is to create new experiences that gamers will enjoy. It doesn't always go that way though, does it? Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, let's talk about the 10 worst game mechanics ever created. Starting off with number 10 is forced app integration in Grand Theft Auto 5. No denying that this is a great game. Like, it's been around for about 10 years, we've all loved it, but that's a long time to have no missteps. And while this mechanic is mostly tangential, there's a lot of annoying and frustrating, unnecessary crap about it. I'm talking about the iFruit app in Grand Theft Auto 5. If you don't know, when it first launched, it introduced integration with a phone app, which wouldn't be that big of a deal, but the stupid app was required to do certain in-game functions. Like if you wanted to customize your license plate, you had to use the app and there was no way to do it in the game. Want to play the dog walking mini game? Well, you had to use the app for that. In the grand scheme, these are minor, but it's also really annoying that you can't just do them in the game, especially because the app was notoriously inconsistent and prone to crashing. Another thing that made people hate the app was that, well, if Rockstar were to take it down, parts of the game would just forever be unplayable. And that's exactly what happened on December 12th, 2022, when the app was removed from the Apple Store and Google Play. They're working on a way to customize your car using a website instead, but the dog stuff is still DOA and it's especially annoying because it's required for 100% completion. Also, why can't you just what? A car customization thing in the game? Why do I need to use a website? It's dumb. Splitting game mechanics across different platforms just sucks. It's a short-sighted and annoying idea that only leads to problems like this. Let us do the stuff in the game. There just wouldn't be problems. Like, I bought a game. Let me game. At number nine is insta-death quick time events. Oh, quick time events are a bad enough mechanic. Uh, they're like just reviled by people, you know? And in a bout of good judgment, they've been mostly excised from modern gaming. So there's not really a lot of QTEs, but there are levels to the ones that exist. Some give you a few chances to fail or just don't matter much in the long run. And those are fine, whatever. If you're gonna throw a couple of those into the game, I'm fine with that. Those don't even really bother me in any way. As long as they don't replace some experience that would be better if I had full control, fine. But then there's the kind of QTE that comes out of nowhere, barely give you any time to react and then kill you instantly if you fail. Basically a slap in the face for no real reason. Uh, like, for instance, in the original Resident Evil 4, not how to do a remake the right way, Resident Evil 4, uh, the original, there was some sketchy stuff, and also, that game is somehow single-handedly responsible for popularizing it despite that. Like, obviously, the fights that have been remade into, you know, actual fights in the new one, they took that away from us, more or less, by making them QTEs. That said, probably the worst mechanically are in Bayonetta 1. Again, great game, but some of these QTEs are just unforgivable. What makes them so bad is they barely ever show up in the game, and they're extremely strict, even as far as these things normally go, and worst of all, if you die, they actually lower your overall score. Bayonetta, like most Platinum games, is one of those games that has an actual importance to the score, and if you messed it up, you would have to restart the level, or your score was screwed. That's just really unnecessarily punitive. Thankfully, later games did not have them, because seriously, they just suck. I love the Bayonetta games, and I love going back to the first one, and if there's one complaint I have about that game, it's these. The flip side of this one is if QTEs had never become popular, I would never have had the privilege to stumble through that market in heavy rain and fight chickens and fall on frozen foods. I, I will say that's probably one of my favorite things of all time. Uh, but is it worth all of these horrible quick time events? Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's worth a lot of them, but all of them, uh, I don't think so. At number eight is the flashlight from Doom 3. Rare to see a game mechanic so universally reviled, it's almost completely removed from every modern version of the game, but that just goes to show you how dumb the flashlight mechanic in Doom 3 was. It was an idea so ill-conceived that it completely dominated any and all discussion of the game. And ah, shit. Here we go again. How it works is so basic, you get a flashlight, like in most FPS games, but if you actually want to use it, you have to put away your gun. It basically works like it takes up a weapon slot, so you are forced to make a trade-off between 
being able to use a gun or being able to see. You cannot do both. Well, at least until like a day later when somebody made a duct tape mod that made it so you could shoot guns and see at the same time. I know the devs wanted to make the game scarier by forcing players to fight enemies in the darkness, but this whole mechanic just raises way too many obvious questions and it just makes the game look silly. Like, let's say, all right, your guy doesn't have a way to attach the flashlight to his gun. Fine. Hold the gun in one hand and the flashlight in the other. That said, the idea that there's not some kind of like strap or adhesive in a space station that you could attach a flashlight to a gun with, uh-uh, I'm not buying it. Now, every version of the game that you can get a hold of has a chest-mounted light by default, and it's... <laughs> It's a lot more fun as a game. The whole flashlight thing just was not a good idea. I mean, I get what they were going for, but let's say you're taking trash out of a garbage can and eating it to make a point. You're still eating trash. And number seven is the instinct mechanic from Hitman Absolution. All right, before the Hitman series managed to revitalize itself and get bigger than ever with the 2016 reboot, there was Absolution, the black sheep of the series. Um, not a terrible game, but a lot of questionable decisions were made with this one. The biggest being, in my opinion at least, the instinct mechanic. If it sounds familiar to you, it's because the same mechanic shows up in the recent Hitman 1 and 2, where you can use a kind of detective vision to scan the environment for interactables, security systems, and enemies. In those games, this mechanic works perfectly fine. No complaints. But in Absolution, wow, it's bad. Now, I am an absolutely massive fan of the Hitman games, and for those of us who enjoy them, we eventually want to play on a harder difficulty. A lot of us get into even the new games and just go to hard by default. But in Hitman Absolution, it's not just that the game becomes harder if you set the difficulty higher. Uh, the game becomes unplayable, all for one simple reason. Instinct drains in this game when you use it. It's used for the game's quick shooting, but it's also used for when you're wearing a disguise and want to blend in. In every other game in the series, blending is a free action, but here you have to spend the meter, and that meter drains fast. So much that it makes one of the basic elements of these games, you know, wearing disguises and social stealth, almost completely pointless. And let's just go ahead and say this. Acting fast because you have a timer and trying to blend into a crowd are contradictory actions. In most cases, it's just better to sneak around in your suit rather than a disguise, which is so antithetical to Hitman that it is, it's mind-boggling. It's just a bad, overly punishing system that makes a game that would otherwise be fun, not fun. For a lot of people, the whole point of the game, playing on Silent Assassin is the point. And someone doing a stealth, yes, they are supposed to act with purpose and swiftly, but a lot of the time, stealth, especially in a disguise, means flying casually, as Han Solo put it so eloquently in Return of the Jedi. And the Imperial officer was gonna clear them. They didn't rush. Why did Hitman Absolution make us rush? At number six is the slam mechanic from Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5. This is a game made up essentially of, aside from bland aesthetics, a uh, series of bafflingly bad decisions in both concept and design. One of the most uh, obvious and easiest to make fun of is this utterly asinine slam mechanic. Uh, I don't even know what the point really is. How it worked originally is if you press the button, your character would immediately slam on the ground if you're in the air as like some kind of combo ender, which I guess would be situationally useful, maybe sometimes, but rarely. That said, uh, this is not Super Mario 64. What's the point of this? If it was just an unnecessary move, I don't think it would be that big of a deal, but the move was also bound to the grind button, so you can't hold or mash buttons to grind, which was like 70% of what you're doing in these games. Now if you hit the button even slightly before touching a grind, you slam into the ground and end your combo prematurely. The game, if you've ever played any Tony Hawk game, is about building up combos, and grinding is a huge part of that. It goes without saying that people were pretty annoyed by this whole thing, and the devs eventually tried to fix it, but they also found new and exciting ways to make the game even worse as they did so. And number five is pressure sensitive buttons from Metal Gear Solid. I know that Kojima is one of those guys who just loves to try out experimental console features for fun. We know. Most of the time it works out though. Like in, in the first Metal Gear Solid where Psycho Mantis reads your memory card and comments on the games you've played. That's a cool idea. Thumbs up there. Patrick, it's true power. Huh. It's useless, I told you. 
This one, ugh. one of the weirdest things about DualShock 2 and 3 was that it had pressure sensitive buttons. And I'm not talking about the triggers, I'm talking about the face buttons. Very few games ever made use of them for what are now, and really should have been then, obvious reasons. But of course, Metal Gear Solid 3 did. If you want to aim in Metal Gear Solid 3, you have to lightly press the square button. And to fire, you press it hard. The difference between choking out a guard and slitting their throat, also pressure sensitive button oriented. Like in a stealth game, you want precise controls. You slip up, it can leave you exposed, and even after years of practice, I, I never got a hang of this. If I actually play it on the console, I'm gonna screw all that crap up. This is a fantastic game, but those pressure sensitive buttons were just awkward at best, actively annoying and hindering to your gameplay at worst. There is an obvious reason why, for many, the Xbox 360 port is considered the definitive version of the game, because that crap was just gone. At number four, everyone dies when you die from Yakuza Like a Dragon. This one bugs me, and it's not just Yakuza Like a Dragon. This is just a really obvious example because it's such a modern version of a turn-based RPG. But you get into a random battle, and for whatever reason, all of the enemies focus on your main dude. He goes down, and that means game over. Never mind that every single party member is as capable as the main guy as raising someone up from KO, either using skills or items, but uh, that's it. Back to the save point. It seems like it should be a thing of the past, but it's in so many games, like recent ones, ones that, wow, they seem like that should be gone by now. Like Final Fantasy 13 has it, Valkyria Chronicles 1 has it, pretty much every Persona still does, and like I said, Yakuza Like a Dragon has it. I mean, it's weird. Like, you can actually go back to some select Square RPGs that is definitely inspiration for all of these, like Chrono Trigger or Final Fantasy VI and VII. Those games knew that that was annoying and stupid. But a lot of these RPGs, I, I don't know whether it's, like, out of wanting to appear credible in the old-school RPG world. I, I don't know. Uh, but like I said, old school RPGs don't all have this. It's pointless. It's more than annoying. And developers need to just let it go. Like, I do not care if it's considered a tradition or, or whatever it is. Losing out of nowhere because your main guy gets targeted is not fun, and it's also stupid. And number three is Dark Souls 2's Soul Memory. Uh, the Souls games all have their fair share of baffling, unnecessary, and confusing mechanics, but one of the most reviled is this one, Soul Memory from Dark Souls 2. In comparison to something like World Tendency, which is just baffling, Soul Memory is actually pretty straightforward. Basically, it's the game's form of matchmaking. The game keeps track of all the souls you've ever collected, regardless of if you use them to level up, spend them on equipment, or die and lose all of them. Uh, what you do with them doesn't matter, just that you have collected them and then the game match makes you with people who have similar soul counts it's a system designed to make players of a similar skill match together but in practice it's quite the opposite players who are good at a game are less likely to lose a lot of souls and won't need to farm while players who struggle with the game die a lot and end up collecting a lot of souls that end up wasted, so inexplicably less experienced players end up in the higher skill brackets, at least according to this system, while better players are in the lower ones. It's completely ass backwards, and it can make playing a game online pretty miserable, which is a shame because a lot of people think Dark Souls 2 is actually the best in terms of multiplayer. It's just a poorly thought out and implemented mechanic that only managed to do the opposite of what devs intended. And number two is Tripping from Super Smash Bros. Brawl. Well, here it is. One of the most inexplicable game mechanics of all time. Uh, nobody knows exactly why it was implemented. Though the director of the game has said some things that imply it was to lower the skill gap between high level and low level players. The mechanic itself is simple. Every time a character dashes, there's a small chance, like a very small chance, like a 1% chance that they'll just fall flat on their face and become vulnerable to attack. That's 
that's all it is. Uh, and while a 1% chance seems small, it's one of those things that's gonna for sure happen at the worst possible times. Especially if you're playing this game like the pros where consistently dashing and dash canceling is a big part of it like melee is really heavy into that i'm not characterizing myself as a professional melee player or anything but i am aware and it's not just a problem for the pros out there it's annoying for everybody including myself and really doesn't do anything to make the game better it just adds an annoying bit of randomness to it like half the fun of smash bros is all of the random chaos but not this kind this is the bad kind of randomness. Just tripping for no reason is, I mean, it's why people trip in real life for the most part, but that doesn't mean I want that in this kind of a fighting game or any kind of a fighting game, actually. What fighting game would be better with this? None, I say to you, none. Nintendo realized it too, because future Smash games uh, don't do this. Like you can trip as a result of some attacks, but it doesn't happen randomly. And finally at number one, the real money auction house from Diablo 3. I I can't even say it without laughing. It's so, I mean, it's one of the worst integrations of real money with a video game. I guess Blizzard wanted a piece of all those players trading items for real money on the internet. So they created an auction house, uh, this in-game menu where you could trade similarly to World of Warcraft's auction house, except you didn't use in-game cash, you used money. It sounds like something like this would be totally crazy, like the prices would spike for everything, but in reality, the game had the opposite problem. Players were able to get anything they wanted super cheap, pennies on the dollar, in fact. So it really messed up the balance of the game, which is reliant on creating powerful builds using rare equipment. Like the issue with the real money auction house wasn't just that it could be seen as predatory. It also made the rest of the game way, way worse, which duh, was gonna happen. It just wasn't anticipated to be this way. Loot in Diablo 3 wasn't a lot of fun to get, and a big reason for that was because Blizzard wanted to encourage players to use the auction, which, boo, come on, man. But most of the stuff you get when you were actually out getting loot was boring junk. Now, what happened was Blizzard didn't make the kind of money they expected from the auction house, so it had to get shut down and the game get rebalanced and crap, uh, which coincidentally made it significantly better once it was gone. Having some means to combat all the third-party trading uh, made sense. At least they managed to come to their senses on this one and remove it, but man, wow. Couple of bonus bad mechanics for you. Low health warning sounds in Legend of Zelda. It's a quick one that's too short to fit as a full entry, but who wants to hear like those sounds? You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> They're the worst, and they start when you really need to concentrate. They just stress you out when you really need to take some time for yourself and see the matrix, so to speak. Definitely don't help. I'm aware I have low health, thank you. And then there's the NPC sneeze from Earthbound Beginnings. Pretty obscure, but it's bizarre, and I have to mention it. In Mother 1, aka Earthbound Beginnings, aka Earthbound Zero, whatever you want to call it, you know, the game that came before Earthbound. There's this insane mechanic where when you talk to NPCs, there's a chance that one is going to sneeze and give you a cold. And it happens, obviously. Apparently, people who wear blue are more likely to do it. I, I don't know. Getting a cold is basically the same as getting poison in this game. And you got to go to the doctor to get rid of it. So while it's ridiculous and stupid, it's actually also kind of funny. Not for the person playing the game, though. It's just a really unnecessary inconvenience. Like, they managed to make the one thing that's supposed to be safe in an RPG, talking to NPCs, into Russian roulette. And that's all for today. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We have a brand new videos every day of the week. Best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription. So click subscribe. Don't forget to enable notifications. And as always, thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at Falcon the Hero. We'll see you next time right here on Game Ranks.